Why would anyone want to take away the life of a lady who did so much good for her family and her community? Our community has lost a tireless worker for human rights. It did not matter if she was being a mother, wife, daughter, sister or solicitor. She always cured for us and that is the way we remember her. She was just as, if I dare say it, she was an ordinary woman who did an extraordinary job. Lurgan solicitor Rosemary Nelson died a bloody death. Her human right to life destroyed in a booby trap bomb at the hands of loyalist dissidents. There are those who seem hellbent, absolutely determined that violence is the way in which you correct your political difficulties. There is a serious vacuum of any dialogue with these people to try and engage them in some sort of process. The loyalist mavericks who murdered Rosemary Nelson first surfaced last summer. Their aim is to kill and maim supporters of the Good Friday Agreement, whether loyalist or republican, unionist or nationalist. They are motivated by religious fundamentalism to prosecute their war for God and Ulster against the union's enemies. For them, it's a holy war, a jihad. Tonight, Spotlight asks who are the Orange Volunteers and the Red Hand Defenders, and why did they murder Rosemary Nelson? Until her murder five weeks ago, Rosemary Nelson ran a thriving legal practice in Lurgan. She had returned to her hometown after graduating at Queen's University. She worked very hard. She worked on ordinary legal cases, you know, conveyancing, uh, all sorts of cases. Uh, she happened to have also clients who were high profile. Uh, these people have to be defended as well. Rosemary was a true friend to everyone. She respected people from both traditions and she was described as being a voice for the voiceless. So the people really are, at the moment feel, feel lost in many ways. The people of Lurgan mourned the loss of someone who built up a reputation as a champion of the underdog. Someone who used the law to effect change. Outside her office, people were leaving a bouquet of flowers. And I remember there was one card that was left in the bouquet. It was a first which described Rosemary as a beautiful woman with a beautiful sense of, of peace, of equality and justice in her life. It was Rosemary Nelson's work for those ideals that enhanced her reputation as a dedicated solicitor. But one case in particular changed the direction of her life. She represented Republican Colin Duffy in the successful appeal against conviction for the murder of a former UDR soldier. She pinpointed that case uh, and Colin Duffy's acquittal as the case which began to mark the deterioration in her relationship with the police. And it was after that case that she really, I think, began to feel that she was being targeted. A matter for other persons. Rosemary Nelson complained she was being harassed by police officers. Later, she told the Committee on the Administration of Justice the harassment had become threatening. She began to receive threats via her clients who were in police detention. So when clients of hers would be arrested and brought to Gough Barracks or Castle Ray, they would then report back to Rosemary that police officers were making direct derogatory comments about her or else making death threats against her. What kind of derogatory comments? Well, there would be comments about her uh, personal appearance. There would be comments about her professional integrity. Uh, there would be allegations that she was involved in paramilitary activity. Uh, and she found those comments particularly hurtful. Her public profile on the Colin Duffy case and her later work with the Gravachy Road residents made her a figure of hate among some loyalists. Many loyalists would have been in the opinion that they were fellow travellers. That's not something that I concur with, but it is undoubtedly, I think, a perspective um, within loyalism that Rosemary Nelson was, was a... a if you like, um, a supporter of the provost as, as opposed to being someone who was uh, uh, doing a, politi or a, a legal job. Since the murder of solicitor Pat Finucan ten years ago, justice campaigners have been concerned by the lack of distinction between them and their clients in the minds of loyalist killers. But they say it's not a problem confined to loyalists. The type of activity which has gone unchecked 
over the last 10 years, the type of activity which has allowed police officers to issue threats and uh, issue derogatory comments against lawyers has really created the context within which uh, lawyers like Rosemary were targeted. Once you begin to identify the lawyer with the crime, then nobody will ever defend someone who's accused of murder or rape or anything. So I think that uh, totally unjustifiably, uh, and it happens perhaps in, in Northern Ireland more than other places, particularly when it's involved with the political, uh, with terrorism, that lawyers do become identified with their clients and th that context in which it happens is created by people who should know better and I'm referring to certain policemen. That's quite disgraceful. No one had any justification whatsoever in carrying out this dreadful attack or any attack on any lawyer. And I've said before and I say it again now, in relation to Patrick Finucane, in relation to Rosemary Nelson, these were people doing no more than their professional best to do their very best for their clients. So the suggestion there be any justification created for any attack on those people is an outrageous suggestion. Rosemary Nelson's murder cast a shadow over courthouses the length and breadth of the country. Us in relation to that matter, that has to be entered for the next available civilian. Patrick Fahey has been a defence solicitor in Oma since the start of the civil unrest. He had much in common with Rosemary Nelson. He too complained about RUC officers. One of the, the most notable complaints was in relation to a young Protestant man who I read in the paper had been sentenced to a term of imprisonment. I was surprised that I hadn't been acting for him because I normally would have done work for him. But he came in to see me on the following week and he was literally shaking as he told me the story that as soon as he asked for me when he was brought into the police station, he was told by the interviewing officer that he was some fucking Protestant to be asking for a provo bastard of a solicitor like that. They went on to say that uh, to him, do you not know that every time he gets to his feet in a court, he gets £25, of which £20 goes to the IRA? They went on to say that I was a senior member of the IRA, but that they believed they wouldn't catch me except they got me with my hand on the bomb. According to Pat Fahey, the abuse of defence solicitors was not just down to a couple of bad apples in the RUC barrel. My experience, and indeed that of other solicitors who have suffered would lead me to the firm conclusion that it has, whether by design or not, it has become institutionalised. It has been a, a pattern of behaviour which has permeated through all of the actions of a large number of police officers who were involved in various interrogations. I, I do would not subscribe to the idea that it was a number of rogue officers who were involved. Pat Fahey says that over the years he regularly made complaints about the behaviour of RUC officers, but he claims no serious investigation took place. Beginning with the intensification of the troubles, and since then a, a culture of unaccountability has grown up around the RUC. They were uh, by default really allowed to do what they liked. And I suppose the, re the reason initially was that there was a war going on and that they were in the front line of it. And that anybody who was seen as the enemy, well then the person who was representing him was next best thing to the enemy. As soon as complaints are made to us, and some of the complaints made on behalf of Mrs Nelson were made by organisations in America, and we treated those as complaints and saw that they were investigated. So any suggestion that there's a lack of accountability, I think, is without foundation. We take all these matters very seriously. Rosemary Nelson's murder was the most chilling reminder loyalist killers have not gone away. She was the third murder victim of the Red Hand Defenders who were engaged in a campaign of sectarian attacks on Catholics, their homes and their churches. They also murdered Catholic Brian Service in North Belfast and police constable Frank O'Reilly in Portadown. He died in October, a month after being hit by a blast bomb thrown during disturbances in the town. Spotlight has established that the Red Hand Defenders and the Orange Volunteers are one and the same, and that they have used these names to disguise their true identity and to cover the activities of some members of Loyalist groups on ceasefire, including the LVF. We have identified nearly 20 of their activists, many of whom have committed acts of Loyalist terrorism in the past, but the most frightening aspect of their campaign of sectarian violence is that it's being done with the blessing of religious zealots. They're fundamentalists and uh, drug dealers. 
and lowlife who are amalgamating um, to, if you like, prosecute um, holy war. Sadly, they will be joined by people who are worried about the direction our society's taken and wondering what they can do about it. And, of course, they'll be influenced by the street politic that can come out of things like Drum Cree and, and the whole marching season. And when we begin to see that a catalyst may well be created that allows this society to explode. And I would ask all unionists to give serious consideration to whom they believe that benefits. And after some articles on the Orange Volunteers, in particular... I'm just Reporter just Jeanette Oldham was taken to a secret location to meet the Orange Volunteers and found herself confronted by two armed men alongside a table with grenades. A man carrying a Bible and describing himself as brigadier came in. I think it was very symbolic that he walked in with the Bible and he put the Bible down sort of between um, the two grenades and they sort of later quipped. But I think they were serious that, you know, the, the Bible was their most um, powerful weapon. And all the way through the, the meeting, they, um, the, the brigadier quoted from the Bible. They quoted from the Old Testament all the time. And they, did he Especially pick the Bible up to do this or did he remember the quotations? He remembered, yes. I mean, most of I, th I think it, the passages were from Deuteronomy. The so-called brigadier's quotations from the Old Testament are significant. One verse in Deuteronomy mentions showing no mercy. A vital clue as to the origins of the new terrorist group is provided by this LVF poster, produced by a self-appointed pastor during last year's referendum. It was distributed at rallies where no campaigners gathered. Spotlight has also learned the names of a number of so-called religious leaders in the Protestant community, self-appointed pastors who have aligned themselves with the Orange Volunteers and the Red Hand Defenders. They say that God is watching over them, that God is protecting them, um, that God is with them um, all the time. Um, they actually pray um, before they go out on missions and they bless the weapons. They have a... Um, self-styled, self-appointed pastor um, who they referred to during the meeting, who wasn't actually present at the meeting. Um, and they said that he um, blessed the weapons before. before they went out on their missions. It seems quite incredulous to me. And, you know, I just hope God's watching because <laughs> he can hardly be quite impressed by that, you know. These religious fundamentalists who tried to bomb as recently as last night use biblical quotations to justify murder in God's name as lawful killings. Attacks against Catholics can be justified in their eyes by their selective choice of biblical readings, preferring the scripture of an eye for an eye to the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. I think the main problem with them is they just can't stand takes, or Catholics or Fenians or call them what you will. But it isn't a question of uh, the expression of, of, of democratic authority that they have a problem with. It's the fact that the Catholics would be at all involved in that. I'd be reluctant to say that the Red Hand Defenders and the Orange Volunteers, any more than the LVF before them, uh, are manifestations of discontent. I think that many of the people involved, and there probably aren't very many people involved in these groups, um, would never have been satisfied with any form of, of process, uh, that there's no strategy involved in that. It appears to be violence for violence's sake. Sectarian attacks by dissidents have largely caused minor injuries and damage. So when the Red Hand defenders admitted making the bomb that killed Rosemary Nelson, few believed that they acted alone. Spotlight has learned that the Nelson bomb was similar to one the UDA used 18 months ago to murder Glenn Greer in Bangor. Our sources say this could narrow down the identity of the bomb maker to one of two men regarded as having the expertise, one from Belfast and one from County Down. The group that admitted responsibility was the Red Hand Defenders. It's widely believed that they didn't have the wherewithal to make this bomb. That's precisely why I need the assistance of the Royal Ulster Constabulary and their intelligence to actually assure me that that is the case, or indeed confirm that they do have that capability. Spotlight has been told that commercial explosives were used in the Rosemary Nelson bomb, but not the type power gel, as is widely believed. Whatever the explosives, 
Rosemary Nelson's killers clearly hoped her murder would have a political impact. And in my mind, they are a small group of fanatics who, while potent and dangerous, at this moment in time, are not much more than an irritant to the wider process. The problem is, of course, that they can be a spark which ignites a flame. Part of the motivation behind it seems to be to try and create the um, justification for Republicans to engage in violence in order to ignite a wider conflict and bring everyone back into a conflict situation. That is something which is extremely dangerous. Small group or not, the new loyalist terrorists say the British and Irish governments are pandering to Republicans whilst choosing to disenfranchise the referendum's no voters. One of those responsible for helping negotiate the UVF ceasefire is Dublin trade unionist Chris Hudson. He warns that if the fears of those opposed to the Belfast Agreement are not addressed, support for dissidents could grow. I am concerned at the demonization of everybody that voted no. We may actually create a, a, a monster that we didn't mean to create, a monster that, that those people who feel that uh, although they're opposed to the violence, of the Red Hand Defenders and the Orange Volunteers are now in the same camp as them. Small groups sometimes have a habit of becoming big groups and we have to be careful that we, we don't see the no camp as some sort of homogenous uh, organ, uh, uh, grouping and that we start seeing clearly the divisions within the no camp as much as there are divisions within the yes camp uh, that we start seeing those divisions and not, not be pushing people who voted no into the arms of those people who want to use terrorist violence. Those who have already chosen the path to violence feel betrayed by the unionists who've signed up to the Good Friday Agreement, in particular by the UVF and the PUP, whom they now regard as part of what they call the pan-nationalist front. For those who negotiated the loyalist ceasefires in 1994, there's a deep concern that no one is at present talking to the new loyalist terror group, leaving them beyond the pale. It would probably be better if somebody came from the no camp who ended, uh, offered themselves as a facilitator to try and get these people away from violence. But I believe there is a vacuum there. I don't believe there is anybody acting in that role as people did in the past uh, with the major loyalist organizations. In that vacuum, the Red Hand defenders appear to have access to the Ulster Resistance arms dumps, the weapons which arrived in the late 80s to be shared among the UDA and the UVF. However, Spotlight has been told that the dissidents secured their own supplies recently, a number of AK-47 rifles and handguns apparently being delivered to Portadown. As they continue to build up their arsenal, it's clear the fundamentalists will be difficult to shake off their present course. The level of expertise that was shown in the murder of Rosemary Nelson uh, could show something that would appear to other people as maybe, uh, to use this awful uh, expression, a sexy thing to do and could attract people into their organizations. I think that is a problem and it's one that we shouldn't uh, walk away from, that we should start um, trying to address this issue in a more serious manner. For nationalists, the murder of Rosemary Nelson raises more immediate questions. Did RUC officers collude in her death? In the week in which the RUC have set up a new inquiry into Pat Finucane's death ten years ago, parallels are now being drawn in the Rosemary Nelson murder case. We have no evidence at the moment that there was any official collusion in the murder of Rosemary Nelson. Uh, one has to remember, though, I think that uh, immediately after the murder of Patrick Finucane, there was little evidence that there was official collusion in his death. Now there's quite significant evidence that there was such collusion. I'm prepared to have an open mind, and I think people should have an open mind. But I have to state that there are suspicions. There was a, there was a huge security operation in Lurgan on that particular evening because of hoax bombs. The question that people are asking is, how come with such a heavy security presence that someone could go into what is a very nationalist area, plant a bomb and get out again and have, have the audacity to do it at a time when there was a heavy security presence?
Suspicion that there was collusion in Rosemary Nelson's killing sparked a violent reaction at the time. Now the new police investigation, led by a senior officer from England, must get the trust of the community if it is to have a chance of success. That's a, an aspect of the investigation that has been actually looked at very, look, very closely since day one of this investigation. I'm looking at it robustly, I'm looking at it rigorously um, in order to satisfy myself that collusion was or was not part of this investigation. It's very important for the community that you're talking about to have the total confidence in my investigation that I will get to the bottom of this. For years, international justice campaigners have been pressing for an inquiry into allegations of collusion between members of the security forces and Pat Finucane's killers. Last week in Geneva, they were focusing on Rosemary Nelson's murder as well. The brutal murder of defence lawyer Rosemary Nelson by the enemies of peace, justice and the rule of law on March 15th would once again leave a chilling effect on the independence of defence lawyers and other human rights defenders in Northern Ireland. While I welcome the move by the Chief Constable of the RUC to invite outside expertise to lead the investigations of this murder with the assist assistance of forensic experts from the FBI, yet I hope the involvement of the RUC in the investigations would not affect the and change the impartiality and credibility of the investigation. That desire for an untainted inquiry is being demanded at home as well as abroad. The conduct of the investigation needs to be by a fully independent team from outside, conducted by that team and by an outside officer. Clearly the RUC will have some input into it. It would be impractical to suggest otherwise, but in the interest of coming to the truth in a way which is credible, the only way that can be achieved is through an independent, a, a completely independent investigation. A very substantial body of solicitors have already signed a petition, which is not yet completed. But we would anticipate that over 200 people will have signed that petition, in which we are calling for the complete removal of the RUC from the investigation. And th that is with good reason. When one looks at what happened to the complaints made by Rosemary Nelson when she was alive about harassment of herself by the RUC, in fact, it, as it turned out, and we have only learned recently from the Independent Commission for Police Complaints, that the, the RUC conduct of that investigation fell far, far short of what would be considered satisfactory. And therefore, one must ask the obvious question, if the RUC was not capable of properly investigating complaints which Rosemary Nelson made during her lifetime, how can they possibly investigate her death? Detectives investigating Rosemary Nelson's murder have been drafted in from at least six constabularies in England. The majority of the inquiry team is made up of RUC officers, although none of those named in Rosemary Nelson's complaints is involved. Even if individuals were persuaded to trust Colin Port, um, who has, after all, a background in leading international investigations, there doesn't seem to be any problem with him leading a team of outside investigators. He has, done, he has already done that in, in Rwanda and in former Yugoslavia. But I think there is a problem um, when the team that he leads is effectively an RUC team, because individuals on the ground see the RUC as still the public face of that investigation. And if those individuals wish to make statements, they have to go and speak to RUC officers. And that is a problem, and it is a particular problem, when, the, uh, when it is alleged that members of the RUC have been involved in threatening the person who was murdered. I would seek to reassure that group of the community once again that I am independent. I would urge them to come forward to me. My experience of the Royal Leicester Constabulary so far has been that the team that I'm working with is a team of dedicated professionals who are really very much focused on finding Rosemary's killers. Um, I have had no problems at all with those individuals or indeed the Chief Constable of the RUC who is as determined as I am to find Rosemary's killers. That reassurance may fall on deaf ears in Lurgan, such as the mistrust towards the RUC in the nationalist community. We understand that there are individuals in the Lurgan area who have information that would be vital to a criminal investigation who are simply refusing to give that information to the RUC. We have had more than an 80% very positive response in all our door-to-door -door inquiries in the area. There are other people, and I hope there is nobody trying to guide them or direct or suggest that anybody with any information should not pass it on to us. 
There is that about 20% that we want a more positive response from. The port inquiry will quickly establish if that small percentage of nationalists in Lurgan can sufficiently overcome their deep suspicions about the RUC to enable them to regard the port investigation as untainted. The RUC chief constable says he hopes allegations and scepticism towards his force will not cloud people's judgment. Since 1994, my organization has arrested more than 3,000 so-called loyalists for serious security-related offences. That compares to the arrest of something like 2,500 so-called Republicans. So I'm just terribly sad that all these allegations of collusion detract from the culpability of those murderers, those terrorists who murdered Mrs. Rosemary Nelson. Let's concentrate on bringing to justice those people. Amid the turmoil surrounding the murder investigation, those closest to the Nelson family are attempting to give them comfort as they pray for justice. The family are waiting anxiously to see what's going to come forth. And that's what we're all waiting for, even in our own community at the moment. Um, certainly, I could say that no one would wish any other family to go through what Rosemary's family has gone through at the moment. And these people definitely need to be made accountable and brought to justice for their evil deed.